Okay, so tonight's speaker uh, is Dr. Jeff Hanlon. Uh, he is the newly elected Three Valleys MWD Director for Division Three, and that is uh, for the cities of Claremont and Laverne. Uh, he was elected this past November uh, 2022. And just a brief bio, uh, Dr. Jeff Hanlon is a professor of pol political science at Whittier College, a water policy researcher and a social scientist. He teaches a variety of courses in American politics, state and local government, public administration, environmental policy, and water law politics and policy. Uh, he lives in Claremont with his wife and two daughters. Um, the first question uh, that uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Director Hanlon is, is about the election uh, and, and I'll, I'll um, frame it with some background. Um, Dr. Hanlon, you were elected in November 22 uh, by the voters of Claremont and Laverne in overwhelming fashion, unseating a deeply rooted incumbent in a three person contest with 52.74% of the vote and over wow. 5,100 votes more than the incumbent. Wow. Uh, your current term is December 2022 to the December 2026. And this race was reported by David Allen in the Inland Valley Daily Bulletin. And what he said was, um, I was following the Three Valleys Municipal Water District election with interest. What is that? It became a referendum on the hard to kill scheme to pump water from under the Mojave Desert to quench Southern California's thirst with the Claremont based district, which the Claremont district has backed. Incumbent Bo Brian Bocock found himself on the defensive against challenger Jeff Hanlon. So with that background, um, the question is first, um, as a newcomer to local politics, congratulations. Do you agree with David Allen's assessment of your election? Um, I do, uh, for, for the most part, um, but I think there is more to it. Um, I think it definitely was a referendum on Cadiz, which is the, the scheme to pump water out of the Mojave he refers to. Um, <clears throat> and it, it is no accident. It was, it was definitely strategic that I wanted to get as a challenger. I wanted to have the incumbent on his heels about it, um, because he had, he had vocally supported this. And I knew that uh, many in my district uh, vocally opposed this for decades. Um, and so it was, uh, it was definitely sort of the hot issue of our election. And it allowed me in this campaign uh, specifically to um, seize upon an issue, I think that highlights that water district rep director uh, which a lot of voters really hadn't paid any attention to for several election cycles. There hadn't been a challenger, nor is it really sort of mm. the, the sexy, you know, office that, that people are, are excited about in an election, that, um, that actually there can be very strong differences in opinion, and those votes, you know, matter on, on stuff like that. So it was, a, it was a really a catalyzing force, I think, for, for um, getting attention on this office and differentiating a real clear difference between me as a challenger and the incumbent, because, you know, in these kinds of races, you run up against the issue of like, well, uh, where the the assessment um stops uh but there's a lot more is that i just ran a more complete campaign all around um we had a lot of voters to reach in two cities couldn't shake everybody's hand right but um making key uh key decisions about how to get my face and my message in front of people multiple times um through a variety of media that 
other candidates did not take advantage of text messaging, emailing, um, the support of Mayor Hepburn, who's on, on this meeting, right? Um, getting out and knocking on doors, door hangers, uh, getting the media very interested and, and utilizing the Courier, um, our local media source, um, and making this issue you know, front and center uh, and, and garnering interest to them. So it was really just like, a, you know, it was an attack on many different fronts um, that goes beyond that it was just a simple referendum. The, you know, the 5,000 votes that I won by, those aren't 5,000 people who hate Cadiz and this water mining scheme. Those are probably people who had never heard of it. So in many ways, it was just, it was a very traditional campaign of, of garnering an image and, and getting out and, and reaching people. Okay, I, I, just to follow up uh, specific to the election, um, what were you hearing from voters that gave you pause and confidence during the campaign? And um, after all the votes were counted and the election certified, um, were you surprised by the results? To the first, first part of that question, um, things that gave me confidence uh, was certainly hearing from a lot of voters, um, talk, you know, talk, just talking to people about uh, what Three Valleys is, why I'm running for this, and, um, you know, things that we can, we can do with this office. I, I was really, you know, buoyed by so many people saying, we really can be doing a lot more. You know, I've been, I've been thinking about water. I, it was it was on a lot of people's minds since especially Claremont and Laverne were hit very hard by this drought and, and had, you know, emergency conservation measures. Um, and so just the the sort of average voter on the street really seeming to, to care about water all of a sudden as a front and center issue. Um, you know, it's it's my passion. It's my life. And it's everything I, I really research and, and uh, focus on. So that gave me a lot of, of hope. For this election and continuing on now knowing that you know so many people are thinking about this and open to all kinds of things i talk to a lot of people you know i when i go out when, when i go out walking i know who's a republican and who's a democrat and those sorts of traditional party lines just really broke down um when i would talk to people it, it didn't seem you know i'm talking to a democratic council and i had your awesome support on that but uh it really was a, a very nonpartisan issue. And I got a lot of votes, you know, from, from people who otherwise wouldn't vote for, for a Democrat in a partisan office. Some things that give me pause, I would say, are that we're about 30 years behind the, <laughs> behind the times, frankly, um, in terms of, uh, you know, what we, where we should be uh, catching up to climate change and its effects. And so we have, we have some sort of low hanging fruit that we can go after conservation assistance and, um, you know, starting some transition with uh, um, how we manage our landscapes here. But we have so much unused storage capacity, most of it under our feet, actually, um, that is going to take decades to really totally maximize. And so, um, you know, Coming into these next four years, it's going to be a lot of, I think, communication about what we can do right now and the long term plan about how we're going to, to transition to a more sustainable Southern California waterscape, um, because we just we have a lot of catch up to do so, uh, knowing that these drought conditions are going to persist, um, even with all this rain that's happening now, um, you know, means that that there's just so much hard work ahead which I'm excited for too, but. Okay, uh, well, before we go to uh, kind of the more policy related questions, I have one more uh, election related question. This is more of a, a personal question. Um, there, there, there's never a perfect candidate or, or perfect campaign. Uh, and so what, what do you wish you would have done better as, as, a, as, a, as a candidate and in your campaign? Um, that's a good question. Um, I realized by the, I didn't answer the last part of your last question too, which is, was I surprised by the results? And the answer is yes, I was very surprised by the results. I thought it was going to be close, but 
you know, every sort of traditional idea about a challenger campaign and in, in a, with, with a third candidate to boot told me it was going to be super close. And I was expecting basically any outcome. Um, so very surprising at the moment. I, let's see, what, what do I wish I could have done better? Um, I think, um, hmm. this is a tough one. I think I wish I, I could have spoken more directly to more people um, about these issues. Um, for the most, for, for a lot of my campaign, and I don't, I don't regret these other strategies of, of, uh, of using media and different, you know, uh, communication techniques to get to people. But, um, you know, one thing that I will improve upon in the next four years uh, is, is communicating directly with many different people in my district to hear their ideas. Um, and part of the reason why I couldn't really do much of that in this initial campaign is I decided to run precisely three months before the election. <laughs> and so time was just, you know, it probably just didn't have enough time in such a big difference, but in, in such a big district. Um, but I would definitely like to, to, to be able to speak to and hear more individuals than I was able to. Okay. Um... So now we're going to transition a little bit more um, to, to the policy side. Uh, but for any of the folks who are with us live, if you do have a question uh, for Jeff, if you could do me a favor and please uh, type it in the chat, uh, that would be helpful. Uh, we can get that queued up and um, ready to go for, for Jeff. But I'm going to transition to a, a question that I would imagine is on uh, the minds of a lot of folks simply because um, we hadn't had an election for this seat in many, many years. Uh, so um, with this recent election um, and for many Three Valley uh, and, and for many voters and non-voters, uh, three, three Valley's MWD is still a mystery. Uh, and for those uh, joining us tonight or others watching, uh, on, on the video at a later time. Could you give us a, a brief introduction on uh, what Three Valleys Municipal Water District is? Sure. So um, Three Valleys is a member agency. It's one of 26 member agencies to Metropolitan Water District, which is the biggest wholesaler of water in the country. And they cover all of Southern California and they source water from upstate and from the Colorado River. Um, and um, uh, bring that water to us and deliver it to us as consumers. And that job and the territory is just so huge that what they did was they broke it out into essentially sort of territorial monopolies, right? Of different agencies that make up membership to Metropolitan. So Metropolitan Water District, the big water district, um, sells water to Three Valleys uh, which then sells water to its customer uh, deliverers. So um, Three Valleys sells water to Golden State Water Company in Claremont, or, and it sells water to the city of Laverne, which delivers water to, to those uh, who live in Laverne, to um, the other water um, distributors uh, in within our district, city of Pomona, or um, uh, the Boy Scouts of America, which is one of the, the deliverers in, in part of our district, um, Roland Water District, other, other uh, members. So there's sort of a middleman, right, uh, in delivering water from a big wholesaler to smaller uh, companies and utilities, which sounds very sort of simple in and of itself. And their mission is simply to, to do that, but also to seek supplemental sources of water for our district. So they can go out and look for other sources of water, such as looking for, for groundwater uh, in the Mojave Desert, right, to purchase um, and to bring into our district or to sell and make money on. And uh, so in that sense, their, their mission is also to, to find more water for us. But that opens up a whole sort of area where we can kind of make this agency whatever we want in a way, right? Uh, 
it can be, and, and these different agencies, municipal water districts um, throughout Southern California are more or less activistic in certain things. So Three Valleys could have that simple mission that it does, um, but it could also do other things. So it could, um, it could be more activistic in um, assisting customers with conservation measures. It could seek grants for building infrastructure to recharge groundwater and capture stormwater. It could um, serve as the lead on projects for um, um, uh, uh, new uh, recycling facilities. Um, it could do education programs. It could be a job training resource. It, it really can sort of make its own mission in all sorts of interesting ways. And different water districts will, depending on the leadership, do some of these different things. Um, or they can remain very simple. And um, in that sense, Three Valleys has been pretty conservative when it comes to comparing it across other, other agencies. It has stuck to more or less a simple mission. Um, but you know, that's something I ran my, my campaign on and I stick by is that I think we can do more in different things because we have to adapt to the, the new understanding that our water resources are totally connected through stormwater, through sewage water, through, uh, through um, uh, groundwater, not just surface water. And uh, so we have to be sort of a team player in this more collaborative sort of water governance field. So I think that's a, a direction that I want to push Three Valleys in and I'm not alone in. Um, and so it, it's a very simple mission in and of itself, but we can, we can, uh, we can mold that um, to serve, serve other purposes for the public depending on what the public wants. Well, well it sounds like you, you have a, um, a bigger and better vision uh, for Three Valleys uh, and, and your division uh, and the benefits that you can bring to the, the community of Claremont and Laverne. So you, so you answered the question, uh, what, what is Three Valleys uh, Municipal Water District? Um, I'm curious, um, could you explain how that fits into the larger water world? And, and why does that matter to, to us as residents of Laverne and Claremont? Yeah. <clears throat> so Three Valleys as um, a, a fairly simple mission organization is a member, really a member to a really big governing sphere ab about water. So it, uh, for example, the board members of Three Valleys are also assigned to many other boards throughout Southern California through, um, we decide as a board, uh, who of us is going to be a representative and sit on the board of directors of Metropolitan Water District, of the uh, Water Quality Authority, which manages groundwater cleanup in the whole San Gabriel Basin, um, with, uh, sits on the Chino Basin, on Six Basins, other groundwater uh, management agencies, uh, various other councils of governments. Um, uh, I, I struggle to remember how many different boards we have seats on. Um, so our, we, 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 our tendrils are sort of out there in many other boards, right? And, um, but what that means is that, that we exert influence uh, on these other, these other elements of government. And we are um, very much sort of uh, tied in with with other actors in the water world, if you will. Um, I'll, I'll give you a concrete example of why this matters, right? We have a seat on the Metropolitan Water District, which controls billions of dollars in, 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 uh, in, in its budget and makes really important decisions about how we're gonna invest that. Where are we gonna put that money? To, you know, to what sorts of different types of technology are we gonna be building? this kind of infrastructure or that kind of infrastructure? Are we gonna be supporting this kind of legislation or that kind of legislation? Um, and so that's a, a momentously important board. And just one example, um, we also are, are tied in with the state, right? Members of our board go and lobby in Sacramento. Um, we, we knock on those doors. We uh, send a representative to Washington DC to meet with our Congress people. We, um, uh, we have uh, the ability to, to really 
understand and be a, an active part of water policy and decision making in California as a whole. So it matters who we elect to it because um, those are the voices that, uh, you know, bigger fish are going to be hearing. Um, and those are the voices that are representing you in Claremont and Laverne. So water policy is, it's a nonpartisan office. And I think for the most part, it's a nonpartisan issue, right? But there are definitely differences of opinion in terms of, of what different directors across the state of California think about these things. So, um, uh, so it is an important office, I think. Okay, so we're, we're gonna transition uh, to uh, the drought. Uh, and um, according to the US Drought Monitor, uh, the West has experienced a long-term drought dating back to the 2019-20 winter and continues across California. Uh, and every part of the state is considered to be in a drought even after this rain. But with all of this rain, um, what does this mean for the local and state drought conditions? And what is the positive out of all of this rain from your perspective? Yeah, um, I wanna answer this. I'll answer this question. And, and also in the chat, a question popped up by is it Joan? Joan, yeah. And I think I can answer, you know, part of this at the same time. Um, the rain is, <clears throat> that we're experiencing is um, wonderful and welcome. <laughs> I'll say that. I mean, you know, yeah, it's a little weird to be getting hit by a hurricane in California in, in uh, January, certainly. But um, from, from this position where we are today to our historical snow and rain averages, we're shooting above average. We're at, we're at something like a 130% of average, uh, historical average right now and climbing. So this is good. Uh, we want this water. Um, but that said, we, we're dealing with uh, year three of a prolonged devastating drought. Our reservoirs are not close to full. Uh, even despite all of this. And so, and this time last year, we had tons of rain and it dropped off and became the driest winter in history after that for the next, uh, what, five months. So we don't know what's going to happen with that. Um, so it's a positive sign. Um, however, you know, we're completely not out of the woods at all. Um, and what's interesting about this is that you know, as Joan mentioned in her comment, and probably some of you have seen this, we've seen articles in the LA Times, like multiple articles about, about all this water rushing off the landscape and into the ocean, right? And suddenly thinking about it in a totally different way, it's not flood control anymore. It's a resource being wasted that we could otherwise be using. Um, and so it's kind of interesting to see that conversation really out in front of us um, now. Maybe I'm maybe I have selective memory, but it I don't recall so many people talking about storm water as they are uh, recently with uh, with these big storms. Um, and so it has really catalyzed a big um, I think push at the state level and the local level about thinking how we can capture this much better. That it's not about flood control. We're not doing the sort of Army Corps of Engineers style of flood control anymore. We need to think holistically about how we stop it and get it in the ground because those are our best reservoirs here in Southern California. And we have Southern California, our basin, the San Gabriel and the LA basin is some of the biggest water storage capacity left in the state of California. Um, and so we can be using it. Um, and so uh, I think it's, it's a really hopeful sign that sort of the wind is in our sails in terms of um, seeking money, support, legislation for um, for for starting big projects uh, in this in this realm. I don't know if I answered all of your questions. I uh, jump. Well, in. I think I think we'll. Uh, I, I had a few uh, related to uh, what Joan touched on. So, uh, Joan, if he didn't touch or if he didn't answer your your question in its entirety, we we may get to that. So. Um, uh, just uh, I'll keep your uh, question in chat in mind as we proceed with some of the um, planned questions. And if, if we don't touch on it, then 
Joan can certainly let us know. Um, again, um, touching on the drought conditions, uh, earlier this year, uh, the Department of Water Resources announced an initial state water project allocation of 5%, only 5% of the requested supplies for 2023. Uh, the yeah. state water project provides water to 29 public water agencies that serve 27 million Californians. And Three Valleys is an agency that receives such water. Mm -hmm. um, so in your, in your opinion, um, given the, the recent rains uh, and anticipated rains this weekend, should we expect an increased allocation after all this rain locally and throughout the state? But also, um, are we too reliant on importing water? I don't know if we should expect it. You know, I was at the Metropolitan Water District committee meeting this week where we were talking, where they were talking about this, um, that if this trend continues, uh, we should be able to, to expect a higher allocation. Um, however, we're also in water debt um, to the state where we have borrowed water uh, and used it over the past couple of years and we have to repay that back. So our allocation might not be um, necessarily higher, um, but it could be. If, if, this if we fill our reservoirs, um, it may uh, alleviate that and our allocation may be beyond health and safety needs, which is what it is as at now. Um, what that signifies to me though, uh, to answer the second part of your question, is something that I, I deeply believe, which is that we are too reliant on state water project water. Um, that, you know, I agree with, with those in our major water agencies in Southern California who, who say that um, we need to minimize our reliance on this water as much as possible because it is so fickle, because we know snowpack over the course of the next hundred years is going to be reducing uh, dramatically. Um, and the storage, that is our major storage capacity, um, that this will just become a much less reliable source. And if we're going to have these, these decade-long droughts followed by a few wet years, that's not a good way to deliver water on a regular basis to so many millions of people. So, you know, that's why I, as a general principle, think we need to be spending our money and our attention uh, not necessarily bolstering and increasing state water project capacity upstate, though the argument can be made that we should be doing that too, um, but that we should be spending most of our attention thinking about how we can uh, use the capacity we have here and get the water that we do get delivered from the state water project into reservoirs here in Southern California. Um, so, for example, in the Three Valleys District, we get lots of state water project water. It comes down through the state water project uh, and, um, you know, into Laverne, right? We get it at Weymouth and, uh, and then and to Miramar. And that water is very important to us. It's a huge portion of our water. The rest of it we get from groundwater. Um, and what, what's great at Three Valleys is that our staff, very knowledgeable staff, is is working and thinking really long-term, big picture about how we can uh, better manage the state water project water we do get in these wet years, bank it under our feet, most notably in the San, San Gabriel water basin, so that we have it there for the lean years. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing to, to, to move water, which is big, and heavy and, and not regular uh, in terms of when it gets here. But the more that we can get it closer to home and keep it close to home where we use it, I think the better off we are for the long term. Okay. Well, we kind of touched a little bit on uh, Cadiz, uh, which um, mm -hmm. for those uh, who weren't aware, it was a proposal to extract uh, groundwater from an aquifer beneath the Mojave Desert process it and sell it to water suppliers in Southern California, including uh, three valley, valleys. Uh, critics argued the project would cause environmental degradation, 
And on September 13th, 2022, a federal court uh, in California provided relief that favored protecting the area. So if not Cadiz, and if not continued reliance on the importation of water, um, what is the better strategy for uh, Three Valleys? And what are some priority local projects that you'll be encouraging to improve our water reliability and sustainability? Um, so I think that uh, A number one, um, the biggest overall water savings that we can have is conservation. So <clears throat> we'll hear arguments that, you know, obviously if you, if you use less water to begin with, um, then you, you're not water stressed. Um, and you'll also hear arguments that, well, we can't conserve our way out of this drought or out of climate change. There's just so much you can do. We have so many people and we have big water needs. Um, but we can achieve significant savings if we conserve where we don't need to be using water for certain things. Um, so conservation is one. I'll get into some projects about, about how that can, can be achieved in a minute. Um, capturing what actually occurs naturally here is a second one. So uh, I think that, um, that we need to be replenishing our groundwater more than we are using natural precipitation um, which we can capture on the ground. We live in a built out area, meaning, you know, most land has been developed that's going to be developed here. Um, and a lot of that is in impervious surfaces, buildings, roads, and so on. Um, we can adapt those structures and those cityscapes um, to be able to capture more water and let it naturally percolate into the ground before it rushes off. Um, we can also um, be thinking more holistically about how we use wastewater Already there's one big project um, called the Pure Water Southern California Project, which is gonna take um, uh, treated wastewater, deliver it, pump it from Carson, California, right? Carson and uh, uh, well south of here, pump it all the way back up here and put it onto spreading grounds uh, in our San Gabriel Basin to recharge our aquifer, which is a fantastic project. Um, we also have other wastewater um, like at our Pomona facility, uh, which is used as purple pipe water. And then we spread that on landscapes, you know, parks and, and cemeteries and so on. Um, but that is water that doesn't necessarily have to be used for that purpose. It can be potably reused. And so next year, the regulations are gonna change where this water can be recycled directly um, back into our system. Um, so that's a really a positive thing as well. So those are things that, um, that I think we can champion in terms of specific projects, for example, um, that can help us on this stuff. Conservation, we know um, the, 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 the easiest thing we can do is change, change our landscaping. Um, and not just talking about individuals ripping up their, their lawns, right, and planting low water stuff, but um, Metropolitan just passed a, a resolution to, to support the ban of non-functional turf, which is grass that doesn't serve a human function, but just serves an ornamental function. So not like your yards that you play with the kids in or parks or, or that kind of stuff where we like to have grass, um, but like um, strips of grass in front of a, um, a commercial plaza that the only people who set foot on it are those who mow it. Right. So just ornamental water heavy uh, uh, landscapes like that. Um, so thinking about how we transition away from those kinds of things to other more water wise plantings that are ornamental. Um, but coupling that with something that we can do at Three Valleys, which I'm going to be working with staff on, which is applying for grants of which there are tens of millions of dollars available, eagerly awaiting uh, districts like ours um, to help transition in that. So provide a carrot along with a stick, right? Uh, okay, how can we give you money literally to help you transition your landscapes uh, in some substantial way and achieve water savings? So that's one thing. And we can achieve a ton of water savings like that. Uh, in terms of stormwater capture, 
again, there are established programs that we can take advantage of grants to, to uh, divert stormwater to infiltration galleries. I was just at uh, our Claremont City Council meeting in, uh, last night. We're building a big new development south of the railroad tracks, and that's going to feature uh, some really innovative stormwater capturing uh, methods that both beautify the streets, um, uh, but also are, are really cost effective ways of recharging our aquifers. Um, so there's a lot of streetscape kind of stuff that we can do that we're, you're going to see. Um, it's going to be happening all around Southern California in the next decade. Uh, is happening now already. Um, and so those are things I'm going to be really pursuing in, in the next couple of years. And, and I think you touched on a, a bit of Joan's question, and I just want to confirm that. The, the plant in Carson, uh, mm -hmm. is that the LA County Sanitation District's effort to uh, not only handle the wastewater, but to um, expand their mission and, and improve our reuse of that? Is, is that? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's for the water, you know, we have, so here we have in Southern California, we have, we have county, San, we have LA County Sanitation, which handles your wastewater. We have um, our, our water districts, which provide water. And then we have replenishment districts, which try and get water back into our groundwater. And uh, for a long time, they've been very siloed. Um, but now, now that sanitation district is sort of openly and happily working with, um, with metropolitan water district and thinking about this as a circular function, not just an input and an output, um, it's really broken up, uh, broken open, I think, a, a, a new realm of collaboration that, that, you know, this is the, I think this is the, the, the proof of concept Carson will be for a lot more action around water recycling altogether. Um, not just in California, I mean, the rest of the world has been doing this again for decades, right? But, <laughs> but you know, uh, with, with our many fragmented local governments um, that we have here, uh, it's just a really hopeful, I think, vision of, of a more, of a smarter water policy from beginning to end. So um, do we know yet um, the capacity of that plant uh, how much, um, mm -hmm. I guess, reusable water um, that plant yeah. is uh, anticipating to produce for the local communities? Or too early to tell? Uh, I believe it's a it's 150 million gallons a day. Um, and uh, of what's going to be going through there and back up. Um, which is a, a good clip. That's that's mm -hmm. a lot of water. Um, I can't recall the sort of percentage of, of total water use that that accounts for for what you we use in general. Um, that's actually going to be dwarfed by LA City's effort at Hyperion. They're doing the same thing with the Hyperion, which is the which is a bigger uh, water reclamation plant. Um, so that's going to be another bit. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't. I can get this to you uh, after later. Actually, a, no, a more I, I think I think that's that's uh, huge. That's huge, and it's great that mm -hmm. uh, the sanitation district has enlarged their their vision of where they fit into that bigger part of the the water reality. So uh, that's good. And yes, please, yeah, uh, me too. If you get that those details. Um, I, I guess that kind of touches on or, or, or gives me a segue to um, Joan's second question uh, in the chat box is, um, you know. We're, we're, we're so drought prone uh, and uh, should we be growing the, the, the thirsty plants like almonds and pistachio nuts in the Central Valley? Um, I guess in your opinion. <clears throat> mm. This is a tricky one. Um, yeah. You know, I don't wanna, I don't wanna tell it's not my job to tell farmers what to grow, right? They can make those, that, that sort of economic calculus on their own. Um, nor do I think it's necessarily bad to, to grow tree nuts, to grow citrus, to grow other thirsty crops that we, that we do grow in the Central Valley necessarily. Um, 
but what what we can do is, and I think this is a more productive route. I'm being very politic right now, but I, the thing about about what we grow in the Central Valley and in California in general is that uses up 80% of our water, right? Is agriculture, and um, yes, you know these are thirsty crops. They're less thirsty than what used to grow there, cotton and alfalfa and those kinds of things. Um, and we're improving our water, watering technology, right? What we are, what we are um, applying to the landscape. And actually we're paying for that. Metropolitan is paying for a lot of that. Um, so what I hope that we can do, and I think we can, should still be doing is making incremental changes in water use efficiency. You know, not saying we're not growing almonds anymore. You can't grow almonds. You can't grow pistachios. They're too thirsty for crops. But what we can do is is um, is alter the incentives, both positive, positive and negative, for water use efficiency there. Because if we can save one percent, right? If suddenly it becomes seventy nine percent of water is used in agriculture, that one percent makes a monumental difference for municipal use which is per capita so much less. Um, so what appeared to be, you know, minuscule changes in, in efficiency uh, when added up across the entire agricultural sector can free up a lot of water for us. Um, you know, to the point where, where some of these drought conditions uh, and, the, and the, the effects they have here on us, municipal users uh, would go away really quickly. Um, so I would say this, I, I think we should be pushing hard for agricultural water efficiency, incentivizing uh, farmers to use water in a more efficient, efficient manner, um, uh, but not necessarily mandating, you know, uh, what they can and cannot grow. So, so we touched on the, the high value project uh, in Carson uh, with the uh, Department mm -hmm. of Sanitation. Uh, and um, we're going to transition to an, a, another type of um, project. Uh, November 17th, 2022, Governor Newsom uh, made a statement, uh, and it was, California needs to diversify our water portfolio and stretch existing supplies as extreme weather threatens to reduce the state's water supply by 10% by 2040. Uh, and he stated, mm -hmm. desalinization uh, is an important part of the state's strategy to address the threats of extreme weather. What are your thoughts on desal? Um, in general, I think desal ha does have a place in our in our water portfolio. Um, there are certain parts in our in our our broader district, right in in Metropolitan's district, where there's no sort of native surface water source. And uh, these are more or less coastal cities. Um, and desalination uh, can, be, can be a tool by which they um, produce water that then frees, essentially frees up water to be transferred, you know, water that we take from, from the state water project or other sources uh, for some of our other communities that that wouldn't benefit from desal, so you know this is a this is a, a controversial. I think desalination is a, is a controversial sort of topic because it's very energy intensive. Uh, it's very expensive to build these facilities. Um, if 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 not done well, it can create uh, bad environmental externalities in terms of uh, how it affects local ecosystems in, in the the brackish wetlands or um, or the, the, the brines that it produces. Um, but overall, I think that these are externalities that can be mitigated without necessarily saying desal is, is, is a, a bad strategy. I don't think it's gonna be our savior. Um, you know, we're not gonna desal water to feed all of, of Southern California. Um, but I, I do agree with Newsom on this point that, um, that it is, it is something that should should absolutely be on the table. Um, desal technology, by the way, it's the same exact. A desal plant is the same plant that you would use to treat um, 
sewage water, wastewater. Um, only the, you know, the Carson plant or whatever, that would be, it would be the same technology. It's a reverse osmosis. Um, uh, it's much cheaper to, to treat wastewater with it because it's easier to remove that which we flush down the drain than it is to remove salt. Uh, cheaper, easier, uh, less energy intensive. Um, so I think we should be maximizing that from just a cost effectiveness perspective. Um, but, but desal itself can, can, can certainly be something that we, uh, um, that we use as a tool as well. Mm -hmm. Well, you may not have thought you'd be asking or answering, I should say, a housing question tonight, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. uh, here goes. I'm going to uh, ask the, the water expert a, a housing question. Um, we're experiencing the impacts of global climate change. Uh, statewide drought conditions persist, while we also have a housing crisis. Uh, there are pleas for more water and pleas for more housing. Um, mm -hmm. How can we build more houses and more wisely use water? And, and what does, uh, from your perspective, what does the better communities of tomorrow need to do today? Mm -hmm. This is more of a city council member question. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, tricky. You know, I've been asked. I've been asked the housing question on the campaign trail multiple times because, uh, you know, you just go to a, you go to any meeting where we talk about building new housing, and um, you're going to hear someone say, "Where are we going to get the water from? We're already starved for water, right? We can't fit this. We can't fit more people in Southern California." And I hear that, and and um, the, but, but the thing I, so I think, I think there are, there are arguments for sort of a carrying capacity of a region uh, in terms of its natural resources. Um, however, it, I think that that argument falls a bit flat when we think about what kind of housing we're providing for the, for the first part. Um, I live in, I live in a house, you know, on a, one of these uh, houses built in the fifties, right. And you have a yard and, and, and everything else. And, um, they're not building those anymore. When we're talking about building houses now, we think about the housing, you know, communities that we're producing in California now, Southern California. It's bigger houses on smaller footprints. It's multifamily units. It is, it is mixed use developments. Um, this is what we're building. And those are, are, are uh, 80 percent less water intensive by use than the traditional detached single family house like the one that I live in and probably a bunch of you live in too. Um, and so it's not a one-to-one -one comparison in terms of how we, we think about uh, we welcoming new neighbors, you know, into our neighborhoods. And so, you know, I think that's an important point to make when you, when you get into a discussion about housing um, is that it, it, it's not quite so simple um, and that we do actually have room and we do actually have water. Um, if, we do a lot of the strategies that I've been talking about throughout here, right? If we continue to think about and source and use water like it's 1970, no, we don't have any more room, <laughs> right? But, but that's not what we're doing. And so, um, um, so I don't know if I answered the question. That's, it's such a big question, I can't answer it completely, right? Um, but that's my general orientation uh, towards that question. Okay. And what, what else was, what else did you ask? What does the better communities of tomorrow need to do today? And um, I think you've touched on mm -hmm. that in, in some of your earlier questions in regards to the vision you have uh, for Three Valleys and the divisions. So um, yeah. I, I think, I think we're fine. So I'm going to uh, make one more play. We are uh, nearing uh, the hour mark uh, for mm -hmm. uh, the speakers program. So if there are any additional questions from uh, the participants uh, that are live, please feel free to do it in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, while, while you think of uh, some of those Q and A's, um, I will pose my last um, planned question. Uh, and uh, it, it, it asks you to think four years down the road. So, so in four years, um, at the end of your uh, <coughs> term, your first term, um, what successes uh, and accomplishes do you hope to be able to um, talk about 
uh, in, in what, what I hope is your, your re-election efforts. Mm -hmm. um, so some real stuff that, that I really hope happens in the next four years is that I hope um, that Three Valleys uh, is the lead agency on multiple multi-million dollar grants um, to help our rate payers with conservation, uh, multiple multi-million dollar grants to build out and transition infrastructure in Laverne and Claremont um, specifically um, for green streets, uh, more stormwater capture uh, that is both beautifying, um, uh, helps traffic problems, and uh, captures water under our feet because we are at the top of our aquifer up here. So it's important that we do it up here in our district, in our division. Um, I hope that I have established a clear and strong connection between our agency, our, our municipal water district, um, which has, has been, um, which is a, a deeply important government agency, I think. And that I think, I hope that I've established a strong connection between it and our community so people know um, what they can come to us for and know that we're doing new, non traditional types of activities in terms of helping people adapt to um, how we should be using water into the future. Um, and I also hope to uh, represent our division and be our division representative on some consequential boards throughout Southern California. Um, and to, to make people, to, to have people know um, uh, what Three Valleys is about. And now that it's, and, and, and make it a, an active player at the cutting edge of, of, uh, of, of water conservation, um, and, uh, and smart water policy in California. So yeah, some image stuff, some representation stuff, but also some actual projects, uh, I hope coming in the pipeline and um, hope to work with my cities who I see on this call, uh, thinking about how we can do that. Thank you so much, Jeff. There, there was a question that came in um, and uh, if, if I don't do it justice, uh, David, please, please feel free to unmute yourself. But um, mm -hmm. does, um, does Three Valleys have the, um, uh, I guess, the authority to impose mandatory, I guess, re requirements? Um, no, we, we don't. So um, what Three Valleys, do, we don't. Um, but what we can do is <clears throat> pass resolutions in support of of certain policies and, um, and propose ordinances and policies at any level of government. So we sponsor legislation in Sacramento um, uh, and we can sponsor ordinances um, in any of our, our member communities um, that we serve. Um, so that's where, we, that's, that's where we, we, we serve in that way, but we have no power, um, we, have, we have no actual um, coercive power of any sort. Though we can, what we can do is use the power of the purse to hopefully go seek assistance. So we're a purely, you know, uh, uh, um, positive incentive agency in that way. Okay, and uh, you know what, Isabel, I'll, I'll just let you vocalize your question. Thanks. Yeah, I feel like it'd be easier for me to say it. So uh, I want to preface this by saying I'm totally, you know, on board and you know an advocate for conserving water. Um, but, you know, I can't remember if it was Jeff or Matt who said, you know, agriculture uses 80% of the water in the state. So kind of similar to Dave's question is mm -hmm. how do you um, convince or force or, you know, get people on board or buy into, you know, individual households or communities um, to partake in the effort of conservation. You know, I feel like you hear the 80% stat and you can be like, well, what's the point? You know, like me brushing my teeth real fast or taking a quick shower, like when the almond growers are using most of the water. Mm -hmm. um, like, how do you how do you get people on board or you know, what do you say to that? Um, hmm. 
yeah hmm. that's a that's a hard one right um i think i mean i think it's important not to to ignore it and to say well there's nothing we can do about agriculture so all you can do is is think about yourself here um at, but what we can do, I think, is, 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 you know, collectively in our districts, in, in, in how we advocate for water policy generally is, uh, is push for more equitable prices of water across the state. So, you know, um, different users of water, be they municipal us, you know, or they, or they be agricultural, pay different amounts for different, for water, right? And, um, so, you know, if 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 there are things that we can do to make water priced more effectively for agriculture, the markets can change uh, in terms of what people are going to be growing. Um, I know a lot of almond orchards are getting ripped up right now because water is becoming too expensive. So, yeah, Isabel, I don't know. <laughs> it's going to be an unsatisfying answer to your question, right? I think, but um no well i think that that yeah. helps is like if you make it undesirable for people to waste so much water you know yeah thing. yeah but you know that i think the easiest thing we can do is or not the easiest thing but the most direct thing that we can do is same is is also say well what we can do is is fight for dollars to help you here right uh our rate payers um, you know, if, if you want to use less water, we'll help pay for that. Um, and that's what we can do. And that's what Met has, has been doing as a direct resource. So we can do more of that. We can do more of that. Um, even if it's unfair and feels unfair. Well, well, thank you so much, uh, Jeff, for joining us. I will give you the, the opportunity for the last word, if there's anything that you'd like to uh, tighten up before we go um, or before um, we conclude the speakers program. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Um, boy, we had a pretty rich discussion and I thank you for those good questions. I mean, we touched on, I think, pretty much all the really important crucial stuff. Um, I would say <clears throat> a couple of sort of parting points is um, uh, as we move into our thirsty months this summer, you know, uh, keep in mind that we're, we're not going to have as much water as rainy as it is as we want for those drier months. Um, so don't let all of this rain fool you. Um, but this is really hopeful. And I would also say this from a, a long-term perspective, um, you know, we talk, we, we see a lot of dire warnings about, about water in California and, um, and the serious water shortage problems we have. Um, but we are still a water rich state. And I think that I'm, I'm, I'm quite optimistic. I say this as a water policy researcher, more, maybe more than a, 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 a representative on Three Valleys. Um, I'm quite optimistic about the directions we're heading in and the policy priorities we are we are pushing towards. Even if uh, a lot of us, a lot of people in government are, are disagreeing about what we need to prioritize to, to, to uh, make real solutions. Um, I think that, I think that, that the, the, uh, um, the, the policy directions we're moving in are really positive. So um, just so you know, I'm an optimist on this stuff. And, and in Southern California too, though it's getting drier, though it's getting hotter, um, and the, though we have less water to use, um, uh, I think that, that there are some serious solutions that, that we have opportunities to grasp. Well, again, thank you so much for your time. Again, congratulations on your success in November. Uh, we, we do look forward to working with you uh, and, and, and walking this pathway to uh, a bigger and better vision for Three Valleys and for Division Three. So again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And 
uh, you take care and uh, hope the new year is treating you and your family well. Thank you. And thanks all for being here. And, uh, and nice to see, see my, some, lots of friends in here. Um, just be in touch anytime, all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff.